And you know, that's not one of my favorite books. I was forcing myself to read it. And I got through with Lamentations and then I started into Ezekiel and I got interested and I spent Saturday night all day Sunday studying 38 chapters of Ezekiel. And you know, I kept thinking in myself, I said, we're starting a family Bible conference. I need to be studying something else that I could minister to people. But did you know tonight, it just kind of all came together that the, I believe that was God because what I saw is the first 24 chapters of the book of Ezekiel is Ezekiel prophesying the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel because they had forsaken God. And you know, as I read through there, we are guilty of every single thing that the nation of Israel did. And one of the things that happened to me yesterday as I was studying this, I was just praising God and thanking him so much for Jesus and that we aren't getting what we deserve. And you know, I think there's a lot of people that don't understand or fully appreciate the grace of God because they've never seen the judgment that we should have. You know, the old revivalists, Charles Finney, um, Moody, and all of these people, I used to really study revivals a lot. And what they used to do is go in and preach the law for 30 days and just put people under the law, get people so convicted. It said that, uh, oh, the preacher that preached the uh, Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, that he would preach a sermon on hell. And you know, I've used this as an example to talk about that we aren't under the law anymore. Well, one day I went to the internet and read his sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And even though it doesn't apply to us because we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and the wrath of God will never come upon us, did you know if you're talking to people that don't know the Lord, everything in it is true. And what they used to do, they would preach the law and it was reported that people would grab hold of the pew in front of them and hold on so tight that their knuckles would turn white because he made hell so real that people would feel like they were about to fall into hell. And so they would preach the law for 30 days and get everybody to see God's holy standard and where we are relative to that holy standard and recognizing that, oh God, we deserve wrath and judgment. And then they'd come back and start preaching the grace of God. But you know, the people wouldn't have received the grace of God if they hadn't really understood how our sin has separated us from God. So anyway, my point is, as I was studying the book of Ezekiel, you know, this is one of the things that happened to me. I just got to thinking, Father, thank you, because I deserve judgment the same as all of these people did. And I mean the things that were spoken, that God was going to do to them and the terrible things that they were going to suffer. Did you know what? Every one of us deserved this. This nation deserves it. But let me share this verse with you as I was reading uh, Ezekiel chapter 22. It was listing all of the terrible things that were going to happen. And then it says in verse uh, 30, it says, and I, this is God speaking, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, have I poured out mine indignation upon them. And he goes on to say that I'm gonna bring deliverance. God was looking for a man. Even as he was pronouncing judgment, he was looking for somebody that would stand up and he couldn't find any, but he basically said, I'll bring judgment. And Jesus is that person that came. Jesus stood in the gap and the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus so that you and I don't have to be judged. I don't believe God is going to judge this nation because he judged Jesus. But I do believe that there's consequences to us just constantly pushing God aside. You know, I've likened it to like standing under this huge umbrella with somebody and it would protect you from the rain. But if you walk out from under the umbrella and if you get wet, don't blame the person that's holding the umbrella. You're the one that walked out. It's not God judging this nation, but it's us that has forsaken God. We say, God, we don't want you. We don't, we don't value you. 
And so many of these quotes, John Adams said that democracy is totally unfit for anybody but a moral people. If America ever ceases to be moral, he said that this republic will destroy itself because we will vote in ungodliness. And that's exactly what we see happening. So it's not God's judgment, it's just us reaping the rewards. We pushed God away and it made us susceptible to the uh, 2001, September the 11th attacks because we had said, God, we don't want you. And so we get wet. We have uh, things happen to us that haven't happened in the past. And so this nation has to turn around. So after he said all of these things, the first 24 chapters are pronouncing judgment upon Israel. And then the next nine chapters are pronouncing judgment upon all of the neighbors of Israel who rejoiced at their demise and at their destruction. And God said, because you've rejoiced to see these people destroyed, then I'm going to bring judgment upon you. And then beginning with chapter 36, he starts talking about that I am going to return you to your land. And I mean, he just starts saying these things like in Ezekiel 36 verse 11, part of that verse says that I will do better unto you than at your beginnings and you shall know that I am the Lord. And he started prophesying and telling them how he was going to return them. And you've got to remember that this was after Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem for the fourth time. He took Zedekiah and slew his children before his eyes and then poked his eyes out and took him to Babylon and he died in Babylon and they were in captivity at this time and now he is telling Ezekiel to start prophesying good to them. Man, that was amazing to me. And you know, as I was reading this, it gave me so much courage because again, I, I'm not gonna take the time to go back and to prove this to you. You ought to read some of these Old Testament prophets as they described how reprobate the people were, how that they were even offering their own children in sacrifice to demon gods. And you know, there's a lot of people say, well, America hasn't done that. I don't see much difference between that and abortion where we have killed over 53 million babies and that doesn't even, did you know New York and California aren't required to report all of their abortions? So I can guarantee you it's more than 53 million. And it talks about the things that they've done. And you see how bad their situation is. And you know what, it gives me hope that here was the Lord. Matter of fact, in one of these verses, I'd have to go over and find it. He was pleading with them. He says, I've said that it's beyond hope. I've said that this judgment is coming. But then he pleads with them and he says, but if you will turn from your wicked ways, he would diminish the punishment. He would let them stay in their land. And he begged with them all the way through it. Did you know if God was for Israel after all of the things that they had done and forsaken him, I guarantee you God has not forsaken America. I believe that God is looking for a man or for a woman that'll stand up and that will do something. And man, the rest of the book of Ezekiel is just promise after promise after promise of how God is going to resurrect that nation. And look at a couple of statements here in chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36. He says, therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And boy, this is applicable to us. You know, there's a lot of people that today despair has set in. Hopelessness has set in because they say, you know what, we have forsaken the right way. We're doing all of these things. Man, we are now saying that God's standards, the public mocks it. They're coming against Jesus on a bus bench. And there's some people that just think, well, it's hopeless. I actually have a lot of people, I've had people tell me before, well, this is just prophecy about the old, uh, you know, the last days, it's coming to pass and it's gonna come to pass and there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the way it's gonna be. Man, I'm glad they didn't think that in World War II. <laughs> you know, I actually heard a sermon preached and the person took Hitler and compared him to everything that was said about the Antichrist how that he would persecute the Jews, how he would do all of these things. Did you know Hitler 
fit the bill of the Antichrist better than any modern day person that I've ever heard compared to that. And there were a lot of Christians just thinking, well, this is prophecy, this is coming to pass, and they just chose not to fight. I just watched a series on the world wars, and man, I guarantee you, praise God for people like Churchill and Roosevelt and others that stood up and fought and said no. And Churchill, man, I heard his speech where he says, we'll never give up. And you know what? These people just decided to stand and fight, even if it cost them their life. And because of it, we came through those things. Did you know back in the Civil War, this nation was as close to being destroyed as it's ever been? I forget the exact numbers now, but the population of the United States at that time, I forget, but it was less than 20 million, if I'm correct. And there was such a huge proportional amount. Matter of fact, the Civil War is one, I think, um, well, I'm not sure, I won't say it. But anyway, it's one of the bloodiest wars that we've ever fought. And when you compare it to the number of people that were in America at the time, it was devastating. I mean, devastating. It could have torn this nation apart. And yet, Abraham Lincoln stood up and decided to do what's right and other people stood up, and because of it, we've recovered. I'm telling you, one of the things I'm getting out of this is he was prophesying, even when they were in this terrible situation of being in captivity, that he was going to once again bring the nation back, and that they would sing, and that they would rejoice. And this is God's will. It was God's will back then under an inferior covenant where their sins were being held against them. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that God, I don't believe, is through with this nation. I am not going to sit there and just submit to it and roll with the punches. And somebody says, well, it's prophecy and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, I'm going to go down fighting. Yay. Amen. And I believe God needs to raise up a group of people today that will stand up and stand for what's godly. I'm telling you, this ungodliness, the scripture says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We are bearing reproach today. Other nations don't respect us because we don't respect ourselves. We've lowered the standards. Some of these quotes that were given tonight were so appropriate to us, and yet they were made hundreds of years ago. Brothers and sisters, we need to stand up. And this isn't just an American thing. This is just stand up for rights, stand up for morality. I was talking to our directors. We had directors meetings this last week. And I was telling our directors, I don't care what nation you're in, if it's in Russia, if it's in Germany, if it's in any of these places, we need to stand up and do what's right. We need to stand for morality. We need to quit being afraid of being persecuted. If our forefathers would have been afraid, we wouldn't have a nation. Did you know when they signed their name on that Declaration of Dependence, they signed a death warrant. And I forget the exact statistics, but the vast majority of the people that signed the Declaration either died or had family members die in the War of Independence. Most of them lost their fortunes. And you know what? They stood and they, they believed in something that was bigger than themselves. You know, I'm not fighting for America as such. I'm fighting for the liberty and the freedom, the godly heritage. And I told Adam when he was writing this, even though he's a Brit, I told Adam, I said, it's not about Great Britain. It's just about freedom. It's about the fact that people stood for something and that they fought for it. And it doesn't matter what country you're from. You know what? The body of Christ needs to stand up. And we still are by far the dominant force in any nation on this planet. But we've got to stand up. God said we are the salt. We are the light. And to do any good, salt has to get out of the shaker. You've got to put it on something. Man, you've got to get your light out from under the bushel. We need to stand up and we need to take a stand and we need to stand for morality. We need to stand for godly principles. We need to speak the truth. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, that we are supposed to speak the truth in love and grow up unto him in all things. 
I agree that there are people that have used the word of God like a club and they use it to condemn people and they do things wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. But love doesn't set a person free. It's the truth spoken in love that sets a person free. John chapter 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And people don't know the truth today. People don't understand. You know, if you stand up against any of the immorality that's going on today, if you stand up against homosexual marriage, people will immediately say you're a hate monger. They'll begin to come against you and criticize you. But did you ever, you ever hear this verse about uh, love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus used that. That is actually a quotation from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 that you love your neighbor as yourself. If you take it in context, verse 17 says that you shall not hate your neighbor in your heart, but you shall in any wise rebuke him and not suffer sin upon him. And then it goes on to say, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you take that in his context and look at it, it is love to tell a person that is living something that is destroying their life. It's love to tell them that this is not a godly thing. And when we sit there and say, well, I just don't want to offend anybody and I'm not going to say anything, you can whitewash it and wrap it any way you want to, but the bottom line is you love yourself more than you love them. You don't want to suffer the persecution and the possible consequences that could go with it. If you truly loved a person, you would stop them from doing, you would do what you can. We can't force people, but you would certainly tell a person the truth. You know, these roads, as you drove up here, if you drove from Colorado Springs tonight, right in Green Mountain Falls, this has been 20 something years ago. I was driving up the pass one night and it was a dark night. The moon wasn't out. It was, it had been raining. There was steam coming up off of the thing. And so there was a fog and you could only see 20 or 30 feet in front of you. And a guy passed me and the speed limit there is 55, I think. And the, and the guy passed me going over the speed limit. And he didn't get very far in front of me until I saw his lights come on. And then his car just jerked over to the right. I could tell he had hit something. And so I slammed on my brakes. And I wound up stopping on the shoulder of the road. And he was in the right lane. And in the left lane was a horse. He had hit a horse. And this horse had caved in the windshield. And this guy was laying there all bloody. And uh, while I was looking at him and seeing if I could help him, a Suburban came around the corner about 60 miles an hour. It was right on a curve and it came around the corner and it hit that horse. And it launched the Suburban in the air about five or 10 feet in the air and maybe 20 or 30 feet long. And the woman who was driving, it was able to control the thing and come to a stop. I ran up to check on her and she had knocked a not a hole, but dented the roof of her Suburban up where her head hit it and she was laying there hurting. And all I could see was that, man, this was gonna be bad. So I ran down the road around the corner and I started jumping out in front of cars. And remember, you could only see about 15 or 20 feet. And they were going 55 miles an hour and I started jumping out in front of cars. And man, they were putting on their brakes and skidding and sliding. Some of them stopped and cussed me out and waved at me with one finger. <laughs> and there were some choice things said about me. But did you know when they got around the corner and saw what happened, I, they never came back. And nobody ever said thank you or anything. But I bet you that there was a lot of people thankful that I warned them. And I'm telling you, what we're seeing happen is worse than a wreck and a physical thing that it can do to you. It's destroying men's souls. And we have to stand up. And I know that there's some people in here doing it. And I'm not trying to put, paint everybody with just one stroke. But I'm saying that as a whole, the body of Christ is not taking a stand. We're confused. We say, well, we're supposed to love each other. Did you know Jesus was love? First John chapter four, verse eight says, God is love. Jesus was love personified. Jesus reached out to a woman taken in the very act of adultery and, and refused to just stone her. 
and told her to go and sin no more. He didn't lower the standard. He didn't say, well, that's not sin. I'm going to change things. It's okay to commit adultery. No, it was sin, but he administered mercy to her. Grace isn't changing the rules. Grace isn't saying that things aren't wrong anymore. Grace is just telling people that God loves you, you old sorry sinner. Amen. <laughs> That's grace. But you need to let people know what's right and wrong. And anyway, this same person who said, turn the other cheek in love, he's the one that made the whip and went in and overturned the money changers and beat these people and drove them out of the temple. Did you know that that's love? And there's a lot of people that can't reconcile those two. I can. I'm telling you, there's a time to stand up and to get angry. When Lawson was talking about it, he got mad. That is a godly reaction. You don't get mad at people. Our warfare isn't against flesh and blood, but it is against the devil. And this political correctness and the fear and the timidness and the things that are being spoken today are wrong. You know, when I finally got around to writing the mayor and all of the councilmen, it was after they had already said they are going to review this and that Lawson can keep his signs up. But I still went ahead and wrote him and I said, this is nothing but timidness and fear and this shouldn't even be debated. I said, the fact that you are just reviewing your standards is cowardice. And man, we need to stand up. We need to get angry at that kind of stuff. It wouldn't happen if the godly people would stand up for what's right. And again, you can do it in a proper way. I said respectfully at the end. <laughs> so that made it all right, everything I said. But I'm telling you, we need to stand up and we need to let our voice be heard. And I'm just challenging you, as we remember what God has done and celebrate, you know what, we've got not just rights, and privileges, we've got a responsibility. We've got a duty. We've got a duty. And you know, in this political time, I'm not real excited about anybody. I'm not gonna sit here and give you all my political views, but Trump isn't my first choice. And there's a lot of things about him that just don't square with uh, everything that I think it should be, but I guarantee you, it is not. There's some people saying, well, I'm just not going to vote. You don't have a right to not vote. You've got a responsibility to vote. Amen. If you aren't voting because you don't like some person, you have just voted for the worst of the two candidates. It's people like that that don't vote that allow this to happen. And I tell you, we have not just a privilege or right, we've got a duty, a responsibility to vote. Man, people bled and died to give us this right. And we need to do something. I just saw an ad last night that played off of this and says some people aren't going to vote because they don't like either candidate. And then they walk to a cemetery and says, I can tell you some other people that aren't going to vote. And then they started talking about the people in Benghazi who are now dead and buried and aren't able to vote. And if you don't vote, then the person that's responsible for that is going to become our commander in chief. I tell you what, we need to stand up and we need to take a stand. So this whole thing of, well, I just don't think I'll vote. Man, you, that is absolutely irresponsible. You know, the Bible defines sin, one of the Greek words, it means to miss the mark. That's missing the mark. That's sin. To have an opportunity to do something and just shirk your responsibility because you don't like the person. Amen. <laughs> There's a lot of other things I'd like to say about that, but I'm not going to. But did you know in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, when I got there, he took Ezekiel in a vision out to a valley of dry bones. And he said this in verse 3. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. You know, that's a smart answer. 
anybody would have thought, you know, it says that they were very dry, that they were bleached. This means that these were bodies that the flesh had already rotted away. The muscle was gone and the bones were bleached. They were dried out. I mean, there, there is just nothing in the natural that could ever cause these bones to live. But instead of just speaking forth what he felt, he says, oh God, only you know. Amen. Don't speak forth your doubt and unbelief. Don't transpose all of your hopelessness upon this nation. At the very least, you ought to keep hope open. And this is what the Lord was doing with Ezekiel. He took him, you know, if you put it in his context, we take this out of context and look at it. But again, if you'd look at the first 24 chapters were the judgment that was coming upon Israel. The next nine chapters were the judgment coming upon all of the neighbors of Israel, Egypt, Edom, uh, Tyre and Sidon and all of that. And then he starts talking about, but I'm going to bring you back. And you know what? Their reaction was, how could this happen? They've already been destroyed. They're in captivity. How could this nation ever revive? And so that's the context. And so he takes him to this valley of dry bones and he says, can these bones live? And then he told him, he said unto him, um, thus saith the Lord God, or excuse me, in verse four, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You know what? We ought to be speaking our faith. Again, I've just been studying World War I and World War II. I've studied the Civil War quite a bit. And I guarantee, you know, back during the Revolutionary War, this nation should not have won. And even after we won, this nation was nearly torn apart because we couldn't agree on anything. I mean, it is an absolute act of God that this nation exists. And it, we, there were people that stood up and began to start speaking forth their faith instead of just letting things run their course. And we need to stand up and we need to take some faith and begin to start speaking over this. You know, if the Antichrist does rise up in my lifetime and come, I'm going to fight him tooth and toenail. I'm not going to bow down to him because he's the Antichrist. Amen. I'm not going to cooperate with him. If he does take over, it'll be without my help. Amen. And so he said, you need to prophesy. He says, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Did you know that the word breath here is ruah? It's the word for spirit. It was translated spirit in over 232 times in the Old Testament. And what it's saying is that when the spirit enters into something, I don't care how dry it is. It doesn't matter how dead it is. When the spirit of God enters in, it brings life. Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And I, for one, believe that America can still be turned around. I believe that we can prophesy. We need to say, we need to speak to it. I believe that we can have a revival. You know, I differ with so many people that preach on revival because what they do is preach that you just go into your prayer closet and pray. And I think that that's what's got us into this mess. And I know some of you think, are you against prayer? No, I'm not against prayer, but prayer isn't a substitute for standing up and standing for godliness and action. Praise God that all of the people in World War II didn't just pray. Man, we got up and fought. We enlisted people and we, we fought. And so when the breath enters into him, he says, prophesy that breath is going to enter into him. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh unto you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied there was a noise Behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, uh, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. That word breath is talking about spirit. The spirit came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy to them. Did you know they were in captivity? They had seen utter, total destruction. Their situation was infinitely worse than our situation. And they were hopeless, saying that there is no hope. We're like these dried bones. And yet God said that there's nothing too hard for him. I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, I don't care who says what. I believe that America is not beyond reach. I believe that Britain is not beyond reach. The European nations and stuff, I believe that we can recover. But for it to happen, God is looking for a man. He's looking for a woman. He's looking for a people that will stand up. And again, we outnumber the others. If we were to just exercise our rights and speak, it's just like what happened with Lawson. I don't know how many time people they've had contact them, but I bet you it's been hundreds, thousands of people versus one complaint. Yeah. And I'm telling you, if we just stood up and stood for what's right, when you go to work, when you hear people talking about all of this ungodliness, just stand and speak the truth. You don't have to be mean with it, but just speak the truth. You know, I was out playing basketball one time with a group of guys, and they were using God's name in vain and cursing and blaspheming and doing all of these things, and I didn't get in their face and say, you know, you're wrong, and yell at them. But after a while, I just got tired of it. So every time I'd miss a shot or something, I'd go, hallelujah. Praise God. And every time I messed up, I'd just go to praising God. After a while, they said, what are you doing? I said, you praise your God, I'll praise mine. And uh, they laughed. And then when they started messing up, they'd go, hallelujah. And I'd go, hallelujah. And you know what? I was salt and light in that situation. It didn't make anybody mad. But you know what? You can change the situation. You don't have to just sit there and let people spew out all of their unbelief. You need to stand up. And you know, there's people today saying, well, we're supposed to obey the laws of the land. Man, if you were listening tonight, Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson, and others said it is our right. It's our duty when government invades upon these things to stand up and to form another form of government or do whatever we've got to do. I'm telling you what, there is a place for civil disobedience. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow. They didn't form a picket line. They didn't form a parade. They just didn't bow. And because of it, man, the king fell down and he says, your Lord, he is the God. And then it says of Daniel that he refused to obey the king's command when he said that nobody could pray for 30 days to anybody except Darius. And Daniel not only prayed, did you know he could have kept his windows closed and have prayed? Lawson could have changed his sign. He had already planned on changing his sign on July the 10th. <laughs> but when they insulted him, he's not doing it now. He's sticking with Jesus, amen. You know what? That's the same spirit of Daniel. And Daniel, he could have kept his windows closed, but he opened his windows and boldly, where everybody could see him, began to pray to God. And because of it, he got thrown in the lion's den, but God shut the mouth of the lion, and because of it, all of his enemies were destroyed. And these people were salt and light in their generation because they did not obey ungodly commands. I'm telling you, I don't know how we got to this place, but somehow or another people thinking that it's wrong for us to stand up and do what's right. That's what's wrong. That is evil. You know, Tyndale translated the Bible into English back in the 1500s when it was against the law. The Catholic Church was forbidden it. They didn't want their people to know what the Bible said because they wouldn't have been Catholics if they'd have been reading it. And so they forbid it, and they were fighting against it. And Tyndale translated it, and then he fled. I forget exactly where this was. I think it was France, and he was caught in France. They brought him back to England, 
And because he refused to renounce his faith and he, he still was promoting putting the Bible into a language that people could read, they burn him at the stake. It cost him his life. But it caused such an uproar among the people to see a man burned at the stake for translating the Bible into a language that could reach people that it was less than, I think it was 20 something years later that King James produced the King James Bible because Tyndale took a stand and caused this backlash. Amen. You can't evaluate what God wants you to do by what the consequences are. We just need to do what's right. We need to stand up for godliness. And we need to hold fast our faith. And praise God, if the Lord turns around and this nation repents and everything goes great, well then, hallelujah, man, we'll be singing praises to God for it. But you know what? I'm going to say what's right. If they kick me off the radio, television, if they take away my 501c3, did you know I'd give whether I got a tax deduction for it or not? They don't get a tax deduction in the UK. And yet those people give. I tell you, what, what stupid reasoning to think that I might lose my 501c3. Who cares? Man, we need to stand for what's right. We need to stand up and we need to proclaim that righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. And it's wrong. And we need to love people that disagree with us. You know, when I heard about this shooting in Orlando, there was a guy that came on Rush Limbaugh's program, and he was a homosexual. And he, uh, I don't know if it was a letter, Jamie's the one that was telling me about this. But anyway, he wrote in. And Says we've been taught that Christians are our enemy and that we have to hate Christians. But he says Christians would never come in and kill people the way that this guy did. He says the Muslims are our enemy. And he says Christians, I know Christians that would take a bullet for me. And you know, I would. If I saw a homosexual that was being assaulted, I guarantee you I'd stand up and I'd defend him. I'd lay down my life for a person. Just because I disagree with what they do, just because I disagree with ungodliness and I'm going to tell them the truth because I love them doesn't mean that I don't love them. And somehow this has been totally turned upside down to where if you disagree with a person, you're a hate monger. I tell you, Christians are the greatest friends that homosexuals have. We disagree with them, but we're never going to go in and kill them. Amen. Man, we protect them. I'm not against homosexuals, I'm against homosexuality. You know that the suicide rate among homosexuals is 300 times greater than any other group in our population. Spousal abuse among homosexuals is like uh, the women, um, a, ho a lesbian relationship, it's 11 times what spousal abuse rate is among heterosexual and among men, it's 35 times greater. Homosexuality takes 21 years off the average homosexual's life. Did you know that smoking only takes seven years off of your life? And yet we put a warning label on cigarettes. 
If we weren't afraid of political correctness, if we were going to be absolutely true, we ought to put a sticker on their forehead saying this lifestyle could be hazardous to your health. <laughs> Not out of hatred, but out of love. Just telling people that, man, there's a better way. God made you for more than this. But Christians have let other people take the high ground, and all you got to do is what Lawson did and just stand up. I don't like to fight. I didn't start the fight, but I'm going to finish the fight. Amen. I love that. So for those of you that feel totally bummed out because we've focused on our nation, talking about politics and how Christians should respond, the rest of the week, we're going to get back on track. But I don't think I'm off track tonight. I believe that this is a godly thing to do. And I'm encouraging you, I'm begging you to stand up and to start being the person that God called you to be. Start using your influence. You know, I've just been teaching on Elijah on television. And I watched these programs because we got some special promos coming up and I wanted to see how they worked. And I was really touched by my own preaching. <laughs> because, you know, Elijah stood up and said, thus saith the Lord, there won't be rain or dew until I say so. And I'm convinced that the way Christians would have done this today was to get into our prayer closet and pray and call for a drought. And then after three years of drought, we would have stood up and said, I prayed for that. And nobody would have believed it. But because he spoke when it had been raining the day before, and because he went on the record and put himself on the line and wasn't timid and wasn't shy, then after three and a half years of drought, he was the center of the entire nation. He was commanding the king what to do, telling the king what to do, and the king was obeying him because he wasn't timid. I'm telling you, the thing that's going to propel us into the position that God wants us to be is to take the word of God and speak it. And some of you think, well, I don't have a word from God. If you're born again, you got a word from God. Your opinion of God is better than the people that don't know God. You, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you know that God fills people with the Holy Spirit today, we've got words from God and we need to stand up and speak it. And if you do that, I can guarantee you there's people that will roll their eyes at you. There's people that will criticize you. There's people that may talk about you behind their back. But there will come a time where, you know, the way of the transgressor is hard is what the scripture says. There will come a time when they do realize that, man, my life isn't working right. I'm in a mess. And you know what? If you have spoken the word of God in love, they'll remember you. And they'll know where to go. But if you have kept your lip shut because you don't want somebody to persecute you, they won't recognize. They won't have a seed planted. They'll think, well, I guess everybody's like this. somebody different that works with them. They ought to know that there's somebody who has different belief system in their neighborhood that goes to their school. We need to speak forth. There's a right and a wrong way to do it. I'm not, I hadn't got time to teach on that, but if you would pray, God would inspire you and praise God. You don't have to, you don't have to say much. 
If we just let our light shine, you'll stand out like a heel thumb. Man, when, the, when things get dark is when the light shines the brightest. And actually, I'm excited. This is a great time to be alive. I teach a course in our Bible school about leadership, and one of the things I teach is that leaders thrive during crisis. You look at any great leader. We've quoted all of these founding fathers today. we quoted Abraham Lincoln. We talked about people like this. Did you know a common thread among every one of them was that they were in a crisis situation. This is where leaders, their light shines. Somebody that just stands up and speaks the truth. A person with the truth is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. I guarantee you, truth is the most powerful force that we've got. And this word is truth. And it is not being spoken in the marketplace today. People have been cowed into being silent. And because of it, this is the reason we see the things happening. And we still can turn this around if we just stand up and speak the truth. You know, the Bible says that he will convict people about righteousness, he will bring back to their remembrance what Jesus said unto them in John 14, 26. He's not going to bring back to remembrance just the fact that you're a polite and a kind person. If you don't give Jesus the credit, they'll think that you're just a nice person. We need to let people know why we're the way that we are. We need to give Jesus the credit. We need to give him the glory. And he will bring back to their remembrance the words that he has spoken unto them. But we've got to be faithful to speak the word. You know, you can't just judge based on how much fruit comes up. There have been people in history in the Bible that have spoken the word and been faithful. Ezekiel is one, Jeremiah is another, Isaiah. You know, Isaiah, it reported that he was sawn, uh, uh, sawed in two by Manasseh. These people were martyred, and did you know what? They didn't see great fruit from their ministry, but they were great ministers because it wasn't their responsibility for the fruit. They just had to be faithful to plant the seed. And you don't know. Sometimes it produces fruit in your lifetime. Sometimes it doesn't. You can't judge by how people respond. But what you can do is to say, I was faithful to speak the word. I was faithful to live the word. I was faithful to do these things. And brothers and sisters, we need to stand up. And whether this nation responds or not, God's going to ask us, what did we do? You know, one of the quotes in this program was for all of the millions that have yet to be born. We have a responsibility to them. You know, if this nation continues, if the Lord doesn't come back in our lifetime, our generations in the future are going to say, what were you guys doing during the... 2000s. What did you do to stop this stuff? Did you just sit there and watch it happen? We have a responsibility. And I tell you, I'm, we need to stand up. So I'm doing everything I can. We're raising up a practical government school. We're training people. And man, we're sending people all over the world. And together, I believe that we are going to make an impact Amen. that is going to bother the devil. Amen. Praise God. So, Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. That's a promise. And you know what? I believe that God is not through with this nation. I believe that we need to stand up. They call the World War II people the greatest generation, and I believe up until this time, that's probably true. That was awesome what the World War II generation did, the greatest nation. But, you know, history's not through yet. This could be the greatest nation if we would have people stand up and take their place. So let's stand, and I just want to lead us in a prayer and pray for this nation. Thank God for what he's already done. Thank God for the history and the heritage that we have. But praise God, we need to dedicate ourselves to standing and promoting the gospel at all cost.
Father, we give you praise. We give you honor for this nation. We thank you, Father, for what you have done. And Father, we pray that the truth about our heritage, the link between God and this nation would be firmly established. Father, thank you tonight for Adam and for all of the people that have done these quotes. And I pray that this, Father, will go far beyond just what's in this room. I pray that the live streaming, the things on our website and other things, that this will go out and that it will inspire people and that we will begin to recognize, Father, our godly heritage. And that, Father, it will inspire us to take a stand and to fight for generations yet to be born. So, Father, tonight we just humble ourselves. And we say, Father, just like it was said there in Ezekiel chapter 36, that it's not for our sake. Father, we don't deserve all of your goodness. The church has been quiet. We've allowed abortion. We've allowed them to take prayer and the Bible out of schools. We've allowed just systematically for our rights to change. Father, we have put ungodly people in positions of leadership because that reflects the values of the people in this nation. Father, there are people that have not voted and are guilty of letting it come to pass without, their, without them exercising their deal. Father, we just confess all of this and say it's not for our sakes. We don't plead for any goodness on our own, but we stand here before you in Christ Jesus. And Father, because of Jesus, because he bore our wrath, because all of your wrath came upon Jesus, Father, we believe that there is mercy for us. We believe, Father, we can count on your goodness. And so, Father, we just turn from our ways. I'm asking that you would speak to every one of us and show us specific ways that in our families, in our neighborhood, in our job, in our churches, that we would begin to start being salt and light, that we would stand up, that we would refuse to allow the devil just to have this nation that has been such a blessing to the world. Father, we just stand and we fight, and I believe that your spirit is going to enter into these dry bones. That, Father, it's not impossible. We prophesy. In the name of the Lord, that Father, you are raising up your body worldwide, not just in this nation, but that Father, the body of Christ worldwide will stand up and take our place, that we will begin to exalt you and to stand against ungodliness. We rebuke the timidity, the cowardness. And Father, I believe that boldness comes upon us. Proverbs 28, 1, the righteous are bold as a lion. Father, I believe that boldness comes upon us. And that, Father, we will stand for truth and put our life on the line and suffer the little persecution. And whether it ever becomes physical persecution, imprisonment, fines, or whatever, Father, we just say that we will stand for what's right, that we will proclaim the truth regardless of the consequences. And Father, I lead my brothers and sisters in praying this prayer. And Father, we mean it and we ask you to use us and help us, Father, to glorify you and to turn the tide of this. We believe that you are well able to do it, that you are looking for some man or some woman. You're wondering why there's nobody to stand in the gap. Father, we say with Isaiah, look no further. Lord, here am I, send me. Lord, help us to take our rightful place. And we believe that your spirit will enter into us and that your spirit will energize us. Like you told Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Father, we believe that through your spirit we can make an impact that will not only change individuals, but change cultures, change nations. Thank you, Father. Father, we agree. And Father, for any person in here tonight who has been convicted and realized that they have been sitting on the sidelines, I pray that you would have them get up off the bench and into the game and start fighting, start taking a stand. Father, give us your wisdom, give us your power, and we believe that it's going to make a difference. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for, our, for this nation 
Thank you for the awesome things that you've done. And in the name of Jesus, we speak that the best is yet to come. We refuse to give this nation over. Father, we believe that this nation's best days are still in front of us.